Welcome everyone to Possessia in partnership with Consonus Investments inaugural is Embedded Finance, the Future of FinTech in Africa. I'm just gonna take a few moments to let everyone trickle in and then we'll get started with some opening remarks and introducing our incredible panelists. Thanks for joining everyone. We're just gonna take a couple more seconds to wait for people to trickle on in. Uh, and then we'll get started, thank you. All right, so we're going to begin. Welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited today to host a webinar on the, is embedded finance the future of FinTech in Africa? Um, hosted by Possession Africa in collaboration with Consumers Investment. Before we get started, let me introduce myself and my co-moderator, Lamide. My name is Elizabeth Dinamenico and I'm a summer fellow with Possession in the role of communications and marketing consultant. I'm a second year university student studying economics and human rights at Columbia University. A brief overview of the agenda for today's event. I'll wrap up with some opening remarks, then Lamide will go to the questions we have prepared for our panelists before going into a Q&A with the audience before closing. Now, let me pass it off to Lamide to introduce himself. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks everyone for joining. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're joining from. Thank you for, for taking the time to join us. Uh, my name is Lamide Adarishan. I'm a principal at Consonance Investments. Uh, we're a VC focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we have a strong focus on kind of financial market infrastructure. Um, we invest in tech and tech enabled businesses. And one of the uh, uh, um, pillars that I mentioned is financial market infrastructure. We've invested uh, in Paseja and Lamy who were fortunate enough to have on the, the panel with us today. And we're, we're very excited for, for the future of uh, embedded finance. Um, so with that said, thanks for joining. I'll, I'll pass it off again to Elizabeth to give uh, intros on the, the other panelists. Thank you. As we've already mentioned, we're joined today by our expert panelists who I'm incredibly excited to introduce. First, we are joined by our, our own Hilda Mora. Hilda is an award-winning entrepreneur and author. She has more than 10 years of experience in fintech regulation and working with multinational supply chain firms like Coca-Cola to develop innovations across Africa. She's the founder and CEO of Possession, a holistic digital fina financial infrastructure, enabling embedded finance to SMEs and institutions looking to add fintech in their products and services. Welcome, Hilda. We're also joined by Samora Karayuki, who is an executive director at FinBank SA in Burundi and has led digitization efforts in the country, including rolling out agency banking platforms and innovative fintech for mass market and excluded customers. Samora also writes for Frontier Fintech Newsletter, which is one of the growing newsletters covering the African fintech ecosystem. 
Frontier Fintech is a thought leader in the African fintech space, attracting a readership that includes founders, executives at leading financial institutions, as well as global VCs. Welcome to Nora. Next, we have Jihana Bus, who is currently the founder and CEO of LAMI, an insurance as service platform that aims to increase insurance penetration across Africa. The Griffin Motor app is LAMI's flagship product and has shortened the purchase, pr purchase process of car insurance to less than two minutes. Prior to starting Lamy and Griffin, she worked as a sugar trader in the city of London, trading on the New York and London sugar markets. Welcome, Jihan. We're also joined by Philip Muturi, who is the head of digital service at Twiga, driving merchant embedded financing and distribution of digital products. He has 10 years of experience in fintech across Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, and a widespread role, including software engineering, product management, and partnerships. Hello, Philip. Thank you for joining us. Finally, we're also joined by Eric Minier, who has helped build fast growth businesses in the high tech digital and financial services industries for the past 25 years. He was instrumental in taking to market innovations at the convergence of the telecoms, financial services, and ID security industries, including smart cards, mobile wallets, and virtual credit cards. He held a number of senior roles for industry leading firms, including 10 years and 12 years of experience as CEO for two different corporations. For the past eight years, Eric has been providing business development and consultancy services to innovative fintech worldwide, developing various innovations. Currently, he's assisting AB Bank Zambia extend the functionalities of their eTumba wallet. We're incredibly confident that today's panelists will provide helpful insights into embedded finance from a unique perspective. Throughout the panel, free, feel free to use the chat and Q&A feature to ask questions that we'll answer during our Q&A session. Feel free to use the hashtag, hashtag embedded Africa, which I will put in the chat following this, throughout today's conversations via Twitter to keep the conversation going. We really want to hear your perspectives today. And with that, you've heard enough of my voice. So let me pass it off to Lamy Day. Awesome, thanks Elizabeth. So I think the first thing we have to, you know, nail on the head is, you know, what is embedded finance, right? I mean, to me, I think it's simply, you know, non-financial institutions or, and companies offering financial uh, uh, products through their sales channels. Um, we can get some more insight into that uh, uh, through uh, uh, Eric, our uh, expert on, from a macro level. Thank you very much, uh, Lamide, for this introduction and uh, Elizabeth for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. It's a pleasure being here. I'm very excited to be talking about a topic that is uh, certainly top of mind uh, given the last two years uh, that we've been through. Um, I think the very first driver for embedded finance is, has been COVID-19. Um, it has accelerated and uh, helped uh, many, many markets leapfrog uh, probably five or seven years of innovation. Um, what uh, embedded finance means to me, it's first and foremost is providing uh, access to uh, a maximum of individuals, wherever they are and from whatever walks of life they are. Um, we need to, uh, embedded finance, the way I look at it, it's, it's you know, people, uh, it's, it's a, a bit of a, a picture, a mimic, but people tend to say we don't need banks, but we need bank services, right? We need financial services. And embedded finance is basically distributed banking. Uh, it is, it goes beyond that because banking is a, a broad word. Um, embedded finance is basically the ability to embed financial services uh, and bring them where it matters in the context of a journey when people are on their smartphones. That's my view. Awesome, thank you. So, you know, on this panel today, we're fortunate to have people, you know, participating in various sectors throughout uh, 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 the, the scope of embedded finance, right? So, I mean, uh, as Eric mentioned, you know, you know, it's essentially providing banking services, you know, so one thing is bank accounts, we have wallets, you know, we have lending, we have insurance, we have distribution. Uh, so next, we'll, we'll, let's hear from uh, Hilda, you know, from a lending perspective on, you know, uh, you know, her industry, if you can, Hilda, if you can descri describe your industry and discuss how companies are leveraging uh, embedded finance today. So thanks, thanks Lamide and thank you Elizabeth for the introduction and uh, bringing this together. 
Yeah, so I'm really glad to be here because embedded finances are definitely something we believe in at Pezesha. So in our world, uh, basically fintech, um, the way we look at embedded finance is it's a stack at which we, um, we enable, you know, uh, lending to happen in a productive manner. So, you know, in Pezesha, we have built a lending infrastructure, you know, that allows us to then, you know, layer every piece of that, um, you know, lending to be productive in a way that, you know, allows merchants and anyone who's offering, you know, traditional and non-traditional workflows to be able to plug in anyone, including financial institutions to almost, you know, any supply chain uh, entity. And so we've been building this infrastructure for the last four and a half years. And that's the hard job we've done to put all the layers together to speak to each other. And of course, we have also brought in, you know, regulators uh, to ensure that we are innovating with them. We earn the trust them and also the liquidity players who are actually bringing the lending um, in a way that we can scale. Uh, and of course, not forgetting, you know, the, the team we have, you know, talented individuals that have come together, you know, to basically uh, bring their talent to building this infrastructure. So for us, it's, it's really a stack um, in a way to drive lending in a productive manner. As you know, currently, there's so many uh, small businesses that have been excluded. We're talking of Kenya alone, where we, we've started building this lending infrastructure. It's a $19 billion opportunity. When we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, this is a $328 billion financing gap. So where are those people going? They are not going to banks. And, and of course, COVID has accelerated that gap. And, and so we've come in with this uh, stack to allow those underserved businesses to be able to access working capital in a, in a way that, you know, it's seamless, the user experience is good, fostering prosperity, and of course, reducing inequalities in the end of that uh, channel. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting. You know, I, I actually want to follow up with a question to you again, Hilda, you know, so what is really driving, you know, the adoption of your product? You know, what, what are your users saying? And, you know, what's, what, what are the main benefits that uh, they're reaping from, from your services? Yeah, so as, as Eric said, I think uh, COVID has accelerated, uh, uh, you know, the adoption in a way that uh, we've not seen it before. Uh, so currently what we are seeing as the biggest uh, uh, trend that's happening uh, is, um, you know, working capital needs, uh, you know, of course, because of COVID a lot of the small businesses that were leaning into alternative lending options, digital lenders in the market who are providing consumer lending, you know, right now they don't have that uh, luxury or opportunity. And so where are they going? You know, they are either trying to survive, uh, you know, liquidity has dried up. And, and so we have come in handy as, as Pezesha to really help these businesses to survive and thrive during COVID. And so we've seen that trend you know, continuing to increase as these verticals continue to integrate because of COVID. And, and, and of course, you know, we plugged in into the traditional and untraditional supply chains because of that and upstream and downstream at the same time. Um, and we continue to see that trend, uh, you know, not just in Kenya where we, we are, but also in the other markets like Ghana and across Africa as these supply chains continue to formalize. So this is exciting uh, because the adoption is increasing and, and customers are saying, hey, because you've come through for us when no one did, uh, we definitely want to, to stay here and, and continue to grow our businesses to, to survive and thrive during COVID. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, Philip, can you provide a perspective from Twiga? You know, how, how are our companies, you know, in, in your industry utilizing embedded finance, uh, uh, financial products uh, uh, currently? Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks uh, uh, for this invite. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Um, yes. So from I'll speak on uh, Twiga's uh, perspective, um, and I'll speak about it um, from two aspects. Um, so we have uh, embedded finance in the in the sense of uh, payments, um, payments being embedded uh, within the customer journey. Uh, and as well as um, uh, lines of credit uh, being embedded uh, in the 
uh, in the entire customer uh, experience and journey. So uh, just to take you back to uh, how uh, the experience essentially uh, used to be back in the day, uh, particularly from the payment side is uh, a lot of cash handling. And once you, uh, it, uh, just to give some background um, for uh, some of our, uh, uh, for the rest of the attendees. Uh, so Twiga is essentially a tech enabled uh, distribution company. Uh, so we do distribute fresh foods and f uh, directly to our, uh, to kiosks and all these shop, small shops and vendors. Uh, and, and we do so for about uh, 35,000 vendors uh, on a month on month basis. Now that's a lot to do. And uh, that means lots of cash handling, delivering to these guys each on a daily basis. Um, and that brings in uh, lots of questions with regards to reconciliations uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the money not, uh, not hitting our accounts uh, in good time. So with the introduction of, uh, you know, let's say embedding uh, MPESA payments within that, uh, within that customer journey, uh, that eliminates lots of those uh, inefficiencies um, from cost uh, all the way to operational headaches, um, both for our company as as well as uh, you know on the vendor side. Um, now, when we look at the the credit um, side of it, uh, that's another thing that we've partnered together with uh, Pezesha for uh, to provide uh, credit to our vendors. Um, our our base our our business is basically uh, cash on delivery. So if a, if a vendor uh, does not have cash um, uh, at the point when we deliver uh, goods to them, uh, what you would ex uh, what they would have to do is basically you know go through some disjointed type of experience of you know going on to. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, to, to just one of these, you know, what many people have been calling uh, loan shark type of uh, digital lenders, um, or you know, with with really high credit uh, interest rates. Um, but now, what the challenge becomes there is that you find that the you know maybe they'd take a larger amount, divert some of it into paying for the delivery. Uh, and hence, it's actually being used, uh, you know, only a small portion of it is being used for uh, to to continue uh, the business and to grow the business, but the rest of it gets diverted to other needs. And that is essentially just delaying another problem down the line. Um, now, but now that's from the customer side, it, it helps build in that type of discipline um, and ensuring that financing that they do take up is put to the right use. Um, on the other side, now on Twiga's end, uh, this this is uh, there are multiple benefits. Um, uh, number one, ensuring that uh, there is uh, the cash is received in good time from the lender on behalf of the uh, the customers, these these vendors. Uh, but number two is that it also is an enabler for growth. So you find that. Uh, through offering these credit lines that are used for the right purpose um, for their business, uh, it does enable them to, in fact, over time, grow their uh, order size. Um, and you know, through that continuous growth, you start you start moving from a micro, from a really tiny business, and you know, you grow over time, and truly changing lives as a result. Awesome! 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 I feel like there, there are a bunch of follow-up questions, but I, I'll come back around, you know, to, to you uh, there. Uh, let's get uh, Jihan involved. Jihan, from, from an insurance perspective, what, uh, is, what is the, the business looking like? You know, what's, uh, how, how are companies accessing insurance, you know, and, and how are they leveraging, uh, you know, embedded finance products like yourself to, to provide uh, 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 products? Yeah, um, thanks, Davide, for the question, and, and thanks for inviting me to be here as well. Um, in I think one of the key things about the insurance market is that, uh, for the most part, it really hasn't changed for 70 years, maybe more. 
Um, so it's really been a very traditional, uh, you know, structure, the way you buy your insurance, the products that are also sold are also sort of one size fits all. Um, so really for us, it was about um, how can we uh, enable businesses to be able to now leverage on um, start selling insurance products without having to think about the complexities attached to um, going after the insurance companies, the policies, the products, um, and having to think about all those different parts, uh, moving parts, uh, to be able to offer such, such services to their customers. So what we've done is, uh, at LAMI is that essentially we're an insurance API. We've worked to digitize the whole value chain of insurance. So uh, we have KYC providers, pricing of product, underwriting, claims processing, um, and other service providers as well all through an API that, um, you know, digital pl uh, platforms and banks are able to now uh, plug in our API to sell any kind of insurance product at any point of sale. Um, I think across the continent, there's a huge uh, growth in digital platforms, um, all kinds of digital platforms that, you know, they're looking to add various kinds of financial, financial services to their platform. But unfortunately, the insurance companies across the continent are, are quite traditional in the way they work. Um, so we saw a gap there. Um, and for us, it, we really do target um, digital platforms that are looking to, maybe they sell goods and services that insurance is complementary to, they might be looking to monetize their customer base further, or um, in some cases, they're also looking to use insurance products as a retention tool. So I think since COVID, we've seen a big shift in, in the mindset, both also from an insurer perspective, uh, as well as a digital platform perspective, because a lot of the digital platforms are now looking to diversify their revenue streams, which is quite exciting for us and, and I'm sure for, for other embedded finance providers. Um, so I think it's that's sort of the main trend that we've been seeing over the past year and a half. Um, but the key thing for us was how can we make the whole process quite seamless? I think, I don't know if any of you have bought insurance in Kenya, but the process can be quite long and, and uh, in some cases quite annoying. So we tried our best to, um, you know, digitize the whole process and make it seamless and also leverage on the data that these platforms have to be able to, um, you know, s simplify the process for onboarding, the claims processing uh, part as well. So we've been trying to um, basically leverage technology and the data that, that di these digital platforms offer to make the, the process a lot a lot more seamless. Um, yeah, I think the the main benefit has been the shift in the mentality from COVID. I, I don't think um, I think it was it was the main thing that made even insurers start to believe that they need to uh, think outside the box in the way they're offering products. Um, so I think it's been quite exciting to see that change over the past few months. Thank you. And then uh, some more, some more, some more, if you can also come in here as well from a banking perspective and provide your view on, you know, how you're seeing uh, uh, banks look at uh, uh, this new evolving um, biz business models um, and th their approach. So thanks, Ravide, and uh, thanks for organizing this webinar. Um, and, you know, greetings to all the participants and the attendees as well. Um, thanks for the question. So I think um, it'd be difficult to answer for all banks because some banks are at a different stage of appreciating what really, you know, embedded finance and banking as a service is. Uh, but I think what I can speak of is how the industry is changing, particularly with technology. I think for a long time, if you consider banking as two elements, the manufacturing of financial services and the distribution of financial services, so the manufacturing of financial services happens uh, at a deeper level when it comes to elements such as maturity transformation, liquidity transformation, and all those you know, core tasks that are done by the banking system. And then on the other side, you have now the distribution of, of banking services through branches, uh, traditionally through branches and stuff like that. And I think it's been mentioned here, I think Jihan said earlier about you know, the one size fits all approach to to financial services. And I think that's because at the time, uh, most of these industries, that's how the technology at the time could allow them to distribute their services. And it's the same in banking. And actually it's the same in a lot of industries. I mean, I think Twitter has come up in the last eight, seven years, and it's also changed the distribution of physical goods from the traditionally tightly integrated uh, distribution mechanisms. And so when you look at, at, at embedded uh, finance and particularly as a subset of banking as a service, what it is is that banks are now changing their distribution of financial services 
um, where now you are focusing on doing all the work, and now they are partnering with um, you know innov innovative players such as Pezesha, Lamy, and Trigger to better distribute uh, their services. So I look as I look at embedded finance as a, a modern uh, technology driven way of distributing financial services. And as Hilda mentioned, uh, it really powers the whole financial inclusion aspect of, of, of financial services because previously the only way you could distribute is through physical branch. And you know a physical branch has to be monetized over a specific period. And, and given the distances in Africa, given the uh, income levels in Africa, then it was kind of impossible to expand financial services. So embedded finance is um, a modern method of distribution. Uh, it really enables finance to be uh, obtained at where it's needed. So it is through your, your trading platform like Figa, whether it's through uh, a social platform like WhatsApp, it just provides the financial service where it's needed. And it's a new, it's a very new interesting paradigm. And I think the banks that, that do embrace this mindset uh, will we, we'll do well in the long term because it really en enables them to increase their revenue so uh, sources as well as just expand their balance sheets. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's just it. I think maybe, Eric, if you can come in here, I think there's there are a couple of trends that are really uh, uh, moving uh, uh, embedded finance. I think you, you touched on a bunch of them, right? Uh, customer demand, right? Just expanding your, your revenue models um, and then just, you know, new... Uh, technologies uh, in, in the cases of of, uh, of uh, Lamy and, uh, and yeah, Sarah. I think <clears throat> yes, very interesting discussion because I think uh, you know listening to all uh, five uh, other speakers, you realize that we very much cover you know what, what is most important uh, for you know we touched on on the customer journey, the customer experience, making it seamless, making it accessible. Um, we, you, you, the technology aspect of it is, is, is fundamental. Of, of course, we need more uh, Pezesha and technology stacks that we can turn to uh, in order to accelerate you know, the delivery of embedded finance into uh, many different contexts and many different applications. Remember that, again, I, I stress the mobile, but of course you have point of sale devices. Uh, Philippe Atwiga was mentioning the need at point of sale devices also, or, or to push services at the point of sale where it matters, you know, where cash is, when cash is needed, you want that merchant to be able to access working capital and to access uh, a short-term loan or a cash advance, or even uh, um, a credit from a supplier, you know, directly offered by the FMCG or by their course, the core supplier who is there to, to, to help out. Now, this doesn't happen today because uh, in the vast majority of Africa, unfortunately, people have little ID or little internet even footprint, you know, sufficient data that we can capture to actually uh, build a value proposition in the context where, when it is required and come at the right time with the right proposition that is altogether not uh, something that you know in the lending space we need to avoid to focus on um, the ability of the customer or the SME to um, to, to um, how do you say to to, um, uh, to 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 pay for the loan or to pay back for the loan. What's important is to fo to focus on their ability, yeah, their, their um, aff the affordability. Can they repay it? And that's our responsibility. Uh, I believe, you know, Pesha, you are confronted with that all the time, but the responsibility of the lender is to actually identify within the portfolio of customers and, and the SMEs, uh, the, the ones that not only just meet the criteria of easy willing to act to take my product. I think the most important in financial services to avoid risk, to do ethical and responsible lending, you need to focus on their ability to repay whatever we are offering. Very often, um, so, so we, that's another angle that we might want to touch on later if we have time. But um, going back to what was said, I think uh, there was um, API as a service uh, came, uh, came strongly from Jihan, you know, as a, 
uh, something that is in the trend of, of the moment is really APIs, open APIs, and the fact that now through a simple API connection, you can access uh, services that are sometimes very complex, but you can trust somehow that you have an expertise behind that API that will deliver the service uh, at the right quality level. And the beauty of today, which is a combination of uh, internet access to the internet, of course, uh, mobile devices, APIs, that to me is, is, is a formula that is uh, accelerating embedded finance in all sorts of industries uh, for the benefit of Africa as a whole. And if we live for that, or if we jump onto these new innovations, uh, we stand a chance, given the creativity of our youth uh, in the continent, we stand a chance to actually uh, be ahead of the game, you know, on a global scale, because we are, we don't have legacy systems that also we touched on from the bank perspective. Um, Samora mentioned that, you know, the traditional way of banking is no longer. And now they need partnerships and now they need um, forward thinking, right? And, uh, and, and those partnerships, uh, interestingly, we can see that banks have, have changed radically also, maybe due to COVID, that full acceleration has changed the mindset. And banks are now more prone to work with FinTech because thanks to API, again, they know they can access uh, and, and plug their core system or their core banking into a, a great user experience and customer journeys. Uh, that, I think is, is very exciting for everybody. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we've talked about a bunch of use cases and you know, we've talked about uh, uh, you know, what embedded finance is. I think to really drive the hammer in the head, it would be interesting to understand like why, why we really should care. Maybe uh, Hilda, you can talk about like how big is this opportunity that you're talking about? And you know, uh, if you can talk uh, uh, a little bit about how you're helping uh, uh, who that your partners are, and you maybe can give some use cases there. Oh, oh thank you, thank you, Lamide. Um, so I think um, you know maybe maybe let me just uh, start by echoing what uh, Eric has, has said, and the rest of the of the panelists. Like, there's no doubt that um, embedded finance is going to reshape a lot of distribution models in how we're thinking about, you know, adding financial services. Um, and of course, the role of technology has really been um, accelerated in that um, manner, where it's not just about, um, you know, providing financial access to consumers, but also businesses, which is where we come in in possession. So I think maybe just to paint a picture before I talk about how the use cases and some of our partners and how we've done it, uh, so, you know, a while back, you know, let me talk about prior to COVID. There's quite a lot of, you know, when it comes to the execution aspect of finance, what we saw in market was a lot of the players um, wanted to do this themselves. You know, they wanted to build this as part of their core business. And, and they, 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 did, they tried, they started to build this lending infrastructure. You know, every company wanted FinTech. And say, want to, we are now offering credit on top of everything else we are doing. And then, you know, a few years later, they realize, look, and, and again, as I said, COVID is a blessing in disguise because what it has done, it has also opened eyes to these companies to realize that lending is not their core business. They should outsource that component to an expert who knows how to do it better than them. And, and of course, at scale not uh, providing credit, but how do you provide credit at scale and provide other financial services on top of that, whether it's to extend your lifetime cycle of your customer or to retain them, especially now more than ever. And, and so we've seen that uh, mind shift, as, as Jihan said as well in the lending space where, you know, these years who wanted to do it themselves, now have come to people like us uh, who have built this lending infrastructure and said, look, this is not our core business. Why can't we partner with you to enable that lending infrastructure 
and embed it to our existing workflows, you know, in a tightly woven manner that basically augment, you know, their already existing business proposition to their customers. And of course, we then layer everything else on top of it with all the hard work we've done, you know, from credit scoring to allowing them to be able to, um, you know, provide credit to their customers the pop purchase to allow them to collect that money, you know, through auto debits. And, and everyone gets a win-win scenario in the end. So it, it has taken us so many years to get there where these businesses that are really in the distribution sector, it has taken them so long to realize this is not their core business. Their core business is logistics, focus on that. Let someone else come in, help you to build the lending infrastructure, they have already done the job, plug and play with the APIs and you're good to go seamlessly, expand your distribution network very easily. And really so we've, we've really seen, you know, really driving that uh, distribution model at the way we scale. And of course, not forgetting, we've now been able to also now provide our lending uh, infrastructure as a service. So where we work with partners who want to white label it and they say, no, 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 we still want to own you know, we have fear of losing our customers. So what do you do? You white label our infrastructure and you continue to do your lending. And, and so we're very excited that, um, you know, the future is already here. And, uh, you know, our partners, you know, Twiga, um, you know, Jumia, iPay, um, and, and many other payment providers in the market, Zumi, Popote, we're coming together to build a much more strong ecosystem that basically drives, you know, that financial inclusion. But at the same time, helps them to focus on their business. I think this is really what, um, you know, the, the, it's talk about, you know, building the future is about. So we're very excited about, uh, you know, this partnership. And to Samora's point, I don't still think banks are ready for embedded finance. <laughs> I still think they are, um, you know, they're still figuring out, you know, are we gonna lose our customers to the FinTechs? Uh, but I think, you know, if, if the banks really think about that strategy, of building uh, banking as a service more than ever because this is the right time. And, and, and collaboration is key, but I don't think we've yet seen that collaboration, in, uh, a collaboration happening the way we would have envisioned uh, it would happen, especially now because of COVID. So hopefully they wake up and they, they partner with us to really drive you know, more growth, reduce the cost, um, you know, and of course, increase their, uh, their revenue as well. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, thank you. So I definitely understand the perspective from a lending perspective. Uh, Jian, can you talk about maybe insurance? You know, are, are people really buying insurance and you know, how, uh, what's that market look like? And you know, how, how are you partnering with uh, institutions to distribute this, uh, your service? Yeah, um, I, I maybe start off by saying that insurance is probably the least exciting of financial services, unfortunately. A lot of people don't really get excited about insurance products because um, it's, you know, you don't see the benefit immediately. So people are sort of programmed to not, um, to not want to purchase it. So for us, it was really about seeing how we can make that, uh, make the insurance products more exciting. How can we sort of leverage the trust that has already been, been built with platforms that already, uh, you know, serving customers um, to now offer services, uh, insurance products at that, at that point in time. So for us, it was about the focus of offering the products the right products at the right time. So eliminating that aspect of one size fits all products that we've seen in the past um, and sort of customizing the products uh, to fit in these new distribution channels, whether it's a per trip product or it's um, you know, a micro policy that, uh, that's embedded in, 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 in part of the payment journey. So for us, um, I would say that um, our key focus has really been the digital platforms and the banks. So I, I think Hilda, for us, the, I think on the banking side, we've seen um, a lot more traction. So it's been quite interesting to see because when you look at banks, they've been a lot of the, the services that banks offer are digital. So you'll use online banking channels, mobile banking channels, you'll, you know, everything sort of works. However, when you want to buy your insurance, you you have to call call them up or go to the branch to, to buy it. So for us, we saw that as an opportunity to to talk to banks and and you know give them a way to now have additional revenues through insurance products. So for example, one of our banking customers, the key issue they were facing was that they had a 50% churn rate on the insurance 
because the process was so long and tedious, um, you know, having to call up uh, the bank and, and go through that process. So for them, it was really about, op, op, you know, sort of optimizing the journey and we helped them do that uh, using our API. So I think it's really about getting the insurance companies to think outside the box, create these new exciting products that fit into new distribution channels, bite-sized products um, that actually make more sense. You know, having a one-year policy, for, for example, for a motorcycle rider, doesn't make sense for them to buy it upfront because they earn so little every day. So for us, it was really about how can we split that up into daily uh, payments or weekly payments or monthly payments so it's actually more affordable um, so that they can actually purchase it. So that's sort of the place that we play is sort of taking these traditional products, breaking them up, seeing how we can make them more interesting and more exciting and fit them into the lifestyle of people uh, that are now using, um, you know, these, these uh, people can buy these products to their distribution partners that they're used to using every single day. Okay, that's fascinating. But I, I think you can touch a little bit more on that. I'm interested, like, in terms of the data points that you're collecting and, and how you're creating these policies, like, how, how, how are you able to, to do that? Yeah, so for example, we we don't show up at all. So through our, we're completely white labeled through most of our distribution partners as well. So for example, one of the key uh, interesting implementations that we've recently done is with a logistics platform. So this logistics platform um, wanted to add like a per trip goods in transit or carriers liability product. Um, and for the policy to basically start when the journey is uh, starting for moving containerized goods and to stop at the end of the journey. Um, but insurance companies had never done this before. So they were sort of, you know, a, a bit shocked at, at uh, you know, how are they going to manage the risk? How are they going to do all these different things? So for us, it was to go into this, uh, our digital platform partner, look at the data points that they're already collecting, the data that they already have on their platform, and then sort of uh, leveraging that to now underwrite the policy and issue the policies uh, uh, automatically. Um, so I think the key thing is sort of assessing the, the data that's already been collected and using that to, you know, instead of asking 20 questions to the customer, maybe ask two or three and the rest of the data is already collected. So this is, these are the sort of things that we try to do to um, sort of make, make the process a lot more uh, simple and um, easy for the customer. Fantastic, thanks. Philip, I'm interested when, when you guys are partnering with, uh, you know, these institutions, like what level of customization do you have to go through to, to partner, um, you know, and how are you choosing vendors to, to, to partner with? Okay, um, yes, so uh, good thing is uh, Twiga is a tech-led business. Um, so we do have a strong engineering team uh, and product team behind us. So, uh, so when it comes to customization, uh, we do uh, do quite a bit of uh, forward planning in the sense that uh, if we do anticipate to, uh, you know, let's say have uh, two, uh, you know, uh, lending partners in this uh, in, in this case, then we need to make our APIs as uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you know as interoperable as 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 possible, right? Um, and as pluggable as uh, as possible for uh, for our lending partners. Now there are obviously some things that. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, uh, position comes through, they identify that, you know, there's something that you've probably not thought of and uh, you need to, you know, you should probably, uh, you know, add this feature or this functionality so that we can optimize operations even uh, further, offer a better cust customer experience. And that is something that now we do take in and we do have to, um, as a result now build in, but in a scalable way that can also still be uh, interoperable with, uh, with, 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 with uh, any other um, partner that we engage with. Um, so, so yes, there, there is uh, a good level of uh, customization that does happen. But so as to make it as efficient as possible, we need to ensure that we're uh, as forward thinking as possible and um, make the APIs as, uh, should I say, as uh, durable um, as, as possible, you know, caters for a wide array of uh, scenarios. That doesn't mean that for every little change that we need to go in and uh, re-engineer. But uh, at most, uh, hopefully, it's just you know changing a config here or there. Fantastic. Um, 
advertising. And so if someone wanted to partner with you, like, I guess, what would be the approach? Would they have to, I mean, do you, are you guys sending out, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, kind of like RFPs or, you know, how, how, how does that work? Um, yes. So what we have is, uh, so we've already set up, like, I'll give an example of uh, on our lending side. Um, yeah. So we, we have built up uh, uh, a lending, or should I say a fintech uh, API um, that, you know, if we are plugging in um, a lending partner, then it's uh, the conversation, you know, once you've gotten past, obviously, the commercials, right, and uh, the commercial terms is that, okay, here are the sets of uh, the APIs, and this is essentially the workflow um, that's expected, and this is how it essentially plugs in at the end of the day, uh, with regards to the customer's uh, journey or experience. Um, and from there, uh, uh, the onus now uh, typically is on our lending, uh, you know, on the, the lending part of that we're onboarding to, uh, to come in and, uh, you know, build out uh, that, uh, you know, their piece uh, to ensure that they integrate well with those APIs. Um, and, uh, all the while, uh, when you know, if there are any uh, questions or comments, uh, you, know, you know, or support needed, um, our engineers are at on hand uh, to provide that 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 level of uh, support, um, and that does. Uh, and throughout that process, um, it is being done like on a staging environment, uh, you know, thoroughly tested before we eventually move on to uh, uh, moving on into. Uh, getting this onto production. Okay, awesome. I'm curious, uh, kind of taking it in a little bit of a turn, but Gian, I'm curious about, you know, what's your opinion on, you know, a lot of you know financial institutions are thinking about, you know, building products and using open source. Um, I, I don't know if you have any take on that and, and you know, what, uh, you know, what uh, your opinion is on that. Yeah, I think very similar to sort of what Hilda said, I think it's really important for these, uh, the bigger businesses to understand that they should definitely be looking at partnerships as opposed to trying to build everything themselves. I think there's, when you look at a, like banks, for example, I think they're the key example of trying to do everything themselves, even insurance companies. However, you have, they haven't, on the insurance company side, for example, they haven't really made any that much progress, to be honest. So I think sort of looking at um, other innovative partners, seeing how they can leverage uh, on, on the technology that has already been built, I think will save them. I think the main thing is cost and time. Um, you know, by the time they sort of build out these big systems, probably there's a new trend and a new thing that has come up and they haven't really made any progress whatsoever. So I would say that I, I think, but I, I think this is changing slowly. I think we're seeing a lot more uh, positive uh, movement on this. People trying to un more, uh, being more understanding of the fact that they really should be focusing on what their core business is. Um, but I think in terms of, from our side, our key thing is making our APIs available so that any sort of digital platform and partner that's already tech driven can go ahead and sort of integrate and build themselves um, using our already available technology. Yeah, uh, it, let me day if I could just add to that. Uh, I think it's uh, also like to me that uh, regulation is also accelerating the aspect of open source. So Kenya, as you know, the CBK just launched the five, you know, plan, which open banking is a key part of it. And, and so, you know, we are very excited about the five-year strategic plan for CBK. And, uh, you know, they're really also pushing banks and uh, financial institutions to open up, uh, you know, their services, their APIs and whatever to really build more products and provide choice to consumer. So we personally, as Pezesha, we're very excited about this plan. Uh, we, we feel we're very strategic to it, especially where trust, choice, and innovation is concerned. Uh, and so we're starting to build towards that. Already our infrastructure is enabling a lot of trust and choice, and of course, innovation. Of course, for APIs, we have financial education to bring financial help. As much as we're going to think about financial inclusion, how can we think about financial at the same time? So there's a lot of to still be done, especially where lending is concerned, in embedding it to customers and giving them choice. And I think open source is uh, gonna drive a lot of that with 
even some of the laws and regulations and policies we are starting to see uh, being put on the table. And we're very excited as Fezesha to be uh, you know, providing authoritative leadership into some of these conversations. Yeah, <clears throat> I wanted to add, if, if we have two minutes, I wanted to add that, uh, again, uh, Kenya, as you mentioned, as you know, the regulator jumped in. Um, as you know, Kenya has had issues in the past with, uh, with um, not, un not responsible or unresponsible lending. And, and what's very interesting is that um, the industry seems to have self-regulated itself. So the industry went faster than the regulators. And uh, it's very good. I don't know whether through technology now, you know, you can afford to, and, and because uh, the word spread so quickly that you can afford to, um, to be, if you're not responsible, let me put, rephrase it a different way. If you're not responsible today, you probably won't last very long and it will be uh, pinpointed out uh, very quickly. So the industry now, uh, if they want to, to, to have a, sustain, a sustainable business uh, ongoing, uh, they have to apply responsible lending practices and best practices. And I believe you organize yourself as a, as a, as a, as a, a country so far, lenders, uh, to self-regulate yourself, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. Um, on, on the bank side, and your comment about banks are too slow, etc. I would, uh, I would ponder that. I would think, you know, I think uh, fintechs, fintechs have had uh, quite a ride the last uh, 10 years and they, and they are growing and they are attracting uh, substantial funds, uh, but they still struggle to reach uh, a substantial amount of customers. Banks historically have that distribution. They have the trust. They still have the trust. It's true that in certain, some countries, unfortunately, uh, sometimes they've broken that trust. So they've lost it, but in general, they are more trusted uh, than, than uh, fintechs. So that is something that fintechs also can leverage and need to leverage in partnership with them. Secondly, you have the appearance of cloud. Cloud infrastructure now makes it far less costly for banks to accelerate their digital transformation. They have access themselves to the same technology and tools that we talked about open source as well. Um, these tools are now made available and the banks have access to it. So they need to move away from their legacy systems and look at how they can become more agile by embracing cloud-based technologies, open APIs, partnership with, teleco with, uh, with fintechs and specialists and, and people who now have proven that they are responsible in their niche market. Uh, and that will really accelerate uh, embedded finance because remember that with our distributed technologies, risk has increased. So you need now to focus on fraud, to focus on risk and managing that risk in a distributed environment that is scaling. And, and that's the, th the, the, the scare at the same time for a lot of players who just realized you know, now they can tap into a much, they can tap into a much, much larger market that they don't know. So uh, we're touching on, 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 on all of the things. So thank you for, I wanted to make that a party. Thanks for the time. Yeah, Samara, it looks like you wanted to jump in there as well, uh, you know, to give your comments, uh, you know, on can, can, can these uh, technologies, can they scale, you know, you know, what's going on in, in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, you know, to your thoughts. So, so thanks for that. Um, I think yeah, a lot has been said, um, and especially, particularly about the banking sector. And uh, you know, I, I think it's it's important to clarify that you know, in as much as you know, it's one sector, there are very different players within the sector, all further you know, far far apart in terms of the approach towards digital transformation. There are leaders who are embracing you know, cloud computing, open banking principles, uh, distributed uh, systems and partnerships and innovations. And there are some that are more traditional uh, on brick and mortar principles. So everyone is far apart in terms of their approach towards uh, digitization, embedded finance and, you know, digital transformation. And I think, uh, I mean, I think Jian said it actually, 
uh, between banking and insurance, like insurance is still very far behind in terms of the adoption of tech. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually it's a shame because I think in my view, um, you know, the customer experience in insurance is so bad and it leads to a lot of drop-offs and, and people end up not buying insurance where they actually need to buy insurance. Um, and I think, uh, I think embedded finance, particularly what, you know, Lamy is doing is brilliant because it would really scale up insurance penetration, which in Africa is largely compulsory insurance steps like motor, motor vehicle insurance, et cetera. Um, as regards, I think someone commented about open banking. Uh, I mean, it's for me, I think, you know, there needs to be balance about this uh, topic. Um, a lot of people approach it as almost a silver bullet. Like once you have open banking, everything just, you know, becomes amazing. But we've seen in different deployments that, um, you know, open banking is an API based concept where you avail your APIs, but behind that is infrastructure, uh, internet and all that stuff. And uh, some, some, some bank services are not available all the time. Some banks give you non-scalable or just poorly drafted APIs. So I think as, this, as, as, as open banking is being implemented, there needs to be a discussion about standardization and specific service level agreements across banking so that you can have proper, you know, the proper scaling of, of, of open banking. And I think one of the main use cases for open banking, particularly in Africa, and it, and, and it, and in fact, in my view, this needs to be extended uh, so that, you know, cause like you look at the example of Kenya where MPESA has more customers than almost all banks combined. And, and this data and this identity should also be put as part of the open banking implementation in Kenya so that someone can transport their MPESA data as easily as they can uh, transport their banking data. And once you do that, I think one of the biggest use cases because of this is going to be KYC and, um, and digital identity. And we've seen it across in, in different markets where companies like Flight, one of their biggest use cases is actually just onboarding. Um, and I think now that enables companies like Lamy, companies like Tazesha, companies like Trigger to do much more when it comes to their FinTech initiatives, embedded financing initiatives, because people can now identify themselves. Uh, you can have a better picture of their, of their financial health, both on mobile money and on their banking transactions. And, and, and it can make some of these consumer journeys much more seamless. So I think it's it's uh, if well done, it's a really good initiative, and uh, but at the same time, different banks will have different approaches, and you know it's a strategic thing. And just lastly, on the issue of like you know embedded finance, it's actually not just you know the financial industry. I think Jihan mentioned something about people fighting to own the consumer. It's actually it's a, it's a big problem because. Uh, technology has changed all industries, not just banking, not just insurance, not just, you know, everything. We are seeing direct-to-consumer propositions globally with companies like Shane from China that are enabled, you know, are fully integrated from the consumer app all the way into the factories. And I think uh, it's, it's a trend that we are seeing globally and not just banks and insurance companies, but everyone needs to understand that owning the customer experience is no longer just, you know, a physical thing where you have the customer. It's now a consumer experience thing. And the banks that build the best consumer experience and the insurance companies that build the consumer experience, the distributors that build the best uh, distributor relationships and consumer experience, those are the companies that are gonna win. Yeah, so thanks. Great, thank you so much. So now we're gonna move towards a QA. and a There are a ton of questions. I'm not sure we'll have time to get to everyone. So I'll make the effort to ask a question to each panelist. I'm gonna start with Jihan. Um, Christopher asked, how are reinsurers valuing the risk of different types of commercial insurance across different industries? And then a second question he asked is, how are projected insurance and lending loss ratios performing compared to reality? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I would say that uh, the main thing about reinsurance companies is that um, they're starting to 
I think they're more innovative than the insurance companies that you have across the continent. They're the risk carriers. They've done a lot of interesting products in other markets. So like in the European market or in Southeast Asia, markets that are far more advanced in terms of the kinds of insurance products that are offered. Um, so I would say that they're open to, uh, they're very open to, you know, trying out new products. I think the key thing is the fact that there's not a lot of data in terms of the African market. So they don't really know how to best price the products, although they can use some of the data they have um, from the other markets that they've tested out products. Um, so I would say that they are sort of, I think they always view risk kind of the same way, but I think now they're trying to, they're starting to open up and, and, uh, try to classify the, the risk differently as opposed to, you know, looking at it from one lens, from a single lens. Um, in, to, in regards to the loss ratios, I think we've seen a lot of, for example, I'll give you an example of our own product. So the motor insurance industry uh, in, in Kenya has a loss ratio of about, of about 74%. It's a loss making uh, part of the industry. Um, and that's really because the, the, the risk selection isn't really done in the right way. So anybody can, every single person is priced the same for insurance products, whether you're driving only to drop your kids off to school or you're, or you're racing in a marathon, for, like a safari rally, for example. So the key thing is that for us, we were trying to um, assess risk a little bit better. So for, we built some algorithms to assess risk based on the kinds of cars that people are, are driving or the distances and things like that. So for example, we had historical data from insurance companies um, and then we use that to uh, claims data. So we use that to sort of build out models to see how we can price the products more efficiently. I think our loss ratio is less than 10 10% uh, compared to the industry average of 74. And that you've only seen just from just from taking data, assessing the data and building out some models to sort of um, to be more selective on the risk, for example. Thank you so much. So a question for Hilda that we have is for embedded finance, it appears there are a number of, number of service providers partnering to serve a microfinance customer. How does the innovation change the pricing structure of the microfinance industry? Sorry, Elizabeth, is, is that question to me? I, 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 I am breaking off. Yes, would you like me to repeat it? Yes, yes, please. Sorry, I have a poor internet. Today. No, no problem. The question goes, for embedded finance, it appears there are a number of service providers partnering to serve a microfinance customer. How does the innovation change the pricing structure of the microfinance industry? Yes, I think, you know, like for us, you know, like, um, you know, we've seen a lot of um, you know, the traditional players trying to be fintech. They don't have the lending infrastructure. So, you know, they still are doing things very manually, trying to onboard customers. The KYC process is very, so the acquisition is very high. So most of these companies, the traditional uh, MFIs, they are really trying to optimize all the costs back to the customer. So they are pushing all the costs back to the customer. The cost of acquisition, um, you know, the cost of onboarding them, getting them to, uh, you know, to be uh, waited for a loan. Um, and of course, if we, you know, for Pezesha, everything is digital. You know, we, our whole process is digital. We embed our credit to partners. There is nothing that happens manually. And so our cost of acquisition, our cost of onboarding is really very minimal uh, because our partners play a role to help us to originate a much, you know, and, and, and evaluate the customer and do a pre-evaluation. By the time they come on our marketplace, we know that this is a good customer. And, and so, you know, we, we are able then to reduce the cost of, um, you know, of, of borrowing and, and the customer then, you know, compared to what we've seen in the market, you know, we're talking about more than 15% per month in terms of uh, interest rate, you know, in terms of possession, this is less than one digit figure, almost for all our loans, uh, you know, to really ensure that customers can be able to pay back. And of course, that leads to our very low default rates that we've seen over time, uh, because, you know, the customers can get our product in a much more, uh, you know, affordable way, but they can also be able to pay. It. So I think the fact that we have digitized the entire process, we've reduced a lot of our costs, and, and also our cost of capital is very low. 
um, you know, because we've also interacted, become innovative in the ways that we, uh, you know, we, we, we access liquidity. You know, we've used platforms, blockchain technology, for example, to access liquidity, uh, you know, and of course, other, other, and other innovative ways where we can reduce the cost of borrowing. I think, you know, most of the MFIs are still operating in a traditional manner. And I think this is the time we've seen, you know, even some of them come to our platform to look for origination. So we are very excited that we have a trusted liquidity infrastructure for Kenya and for Africa where even the MFIs were operating traditionally, they are already seeing their cost doesn't make sense. And so they're already deploying their capital through Pezesha to allow us to originate them, quality customers, quality SMEs that they can lend to them and actually make a much more better return compared to their default rates that they take, they, they, they take home with. And of course, in the end, it just makes uh, their business. So we're very excited that uh, there's quite a lot happening uh, in collaboration with traditional MFIs and, and helping them to scale and becoming liqu liquidity uh, trust partner. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. This question is for Philip. As a supply chain network, what is the benefit of outsourcing the financing option? How do you make the build in-house versus the outsource to possess a decision? Um, all right. So uh, the benefit of outsourcing the financing option. Uh, number one, it just enables you to, for us as Twiga in, uh, in this case, uh, to maintain focus on our core business. Um, and then secondly, is just the, the just de-risking, um, essentially. Uh, you know, the, the moment you decide to do it on, uh, you know, for instance, offering this credit uh, to our vendors, uh, then that means that we are adding additional, uh, you know, credit risk, um, number one. Uh, and, you know, since it's not something that is our core business and, you know, we haven't invested all, you know, that type of effort into it, uh, there's, there's an element, there's an additional element of risk that, you know, you might not be as successful as someone who's done it uh, as their core business. Um, to answer the second part of the question, how do you make the build in-house versus the outsource uh, to possess a um, decision? Um, I think the first, I think there are a couple of things, uh, I think keywords that I that I'll look at. Um, number one is uh, speed, uh, speed to market. Two is uh, cost. Um, and then three is, I, I touched on it, uh, risk. Um, so... Uh, just to elaborate, uh, so speed to market. Um, if we are to, let's say, decide, hey, let's build in-house, number one, that is a long-term uh, commitment that we that we need to make. And uh, my general rule of thumb is that if you're doing, if you're taking on something long-term, then there must be some level of guarantee that you know, or you know, some some aspect of that it has been proven that it's going to work. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but now if you're, you know, if you're probably starting this out um, for the first time, you haven't done it, uh, I would generally lean on the, you know, outsource uh, uh, option um, and, you know, lean on the experts, uh, you know, they, they basically uh, help you to now uh, de-risk uh, that, uh, uh, you know, this, 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 so, uh, financing that you that you want to introduce so yeah in in, in a nutshell uh, uh you know helps to reduce uh the, co the initial cost outlay um, for that long-term commitment and secondly uh, additional benefits of uh you know getting to the market really quickly testing it out and uh, most likely actually succeeding um as as we've uh, actually gotten to see with possession I don't know if you want to jump in there as well, just to talk about the infrastructure that you're building, you know, and kind of why that's your service uh, offering would be superior. Yeah, I think I think Philip has uh, echoed all the things. I, I don't think I want to repeat here what he said. I think it's a win-win. We make it to be a win-win. If everyone wins, then it works. 
uh, and the way we've embedded credit, um, at least for Pezesha, is our partners win, we win, the entire value chain wins. Uh, we are providing value across every entity or, or, or partner that is involved. So whether it's a distributor, whether it's a retailer, whether it's a supplier, everyone is winning, whether it's from a revenue basis, sales, retaining customers, um, and of course, um, increasing their profits, um, you know, and, and income, um, it's, it's really something that uh, uh, motivates us to continue to do this. So we're very excited to be working with Twitter. Uh, but of course, we're always looking at ways we can accelerate other financial services on top of that. So um, there's quite a lot of work to still do and a lot of things thinking about for the long-term scale. So the superior aspect is making it a win-win and everyone benefits and the value proposition is, is felt by every party and it's key. Um, and then of course, it's now what, what next can we do together to, to grow our customers and, and to grow the the, the build that we are creating. Thank you. So this question is for Eric. How is embedded finance different slash distinct from banks efforts at going digital examples, online banking, mobile banking apps, et cetera? Is distributed banking purely or, or overwhelmingly a mobile phone phenomenon? I think it will be an overwhelmingly mobile phone phenomenon until we have something better than a mobile phone. But um, um, you, you know, you have you have wearables now, and of course, you have the smartwatches and the likes. IoT is also going to be a big uh, thing that will request um, payment for for one, but also why not um, particular <laughs> other insurance? Why not? Um, so machines and people. Um, need and will need to, to have access to financial services. But um, how is it different from, the question is how really, how is it different and distinct for banks? The bank's effort today is, is really to, to push their brand into a mobile app and to offer their customers mobile internet banking and the likes, right? And, and to broaden that and to try to add more and more services to it. It's great, but they, they will only satisfy and, and deal with the customers that their brand can talk to. Embedded finance is another way to actually for them to branch out and to develop not only vertically, but also horizontally. So with embedded finance, they can provide the fact that they are a trusted custodian of why not identification as well. You know, my ID, my KYC has been done thoroughly by a bank. Uh, why do I have to give it and to give my passport and my details to every application that I sign up for? I should have one registry, done it once, and those applications should be able to pull it on demand. In the same manner, so they should be able to put my, pull my KYC and then you could do, yes, add an, an, an OTP or something to make sure that I am who I say I, say I am, or even better, a video or a biometric, but that would help already the user interface. Remember that when, when you launch a new app, you, whether it's insurance, whether it's uh, lending, whether, whatever the brand carries you with them, if the customer has to register for it, uh, you will lose probably half already of the people, if not more, depending on how uh, the user experience is. Uh, from the moment you ask for KYC requirement and an ID document, et cetera, et cetera. If it was as simple as you've done it before, let me bring it here. And if there is only us to do a check, it should be an onboarding process should be just, oh, let me take a picture of, you know, or please send me a picture or a live picture of your face. And that will complement or satisfy a full authentication, for example, in an onboarding process. So embedding finance to me is really growing laterally and for a bank, the opportunity is to partner with new distribution channels. Distribution for any product that I know of is the key. It's the number one thing. It's distribution. How do you reach customers? If you look at Jumo, for example, they were very successful at reaching in Ghana millions of individuals through a partnership with telecom operators. Um, 
because they have that distribution reach. Now, Jumo as a brand does not exist. It is similar to Pesesha, a technology stack only. Um, that's an example. So I think business and, and, and their business is thriving, but they are behind. So some banks will have to make that call and maybe to decide sometimes to disappear as a brand and to be embedded into somebody else's brand. Think big techs coming, think uh, uh, you know, other big brands that, have, that are very appealing to customers. The youth will talk to certain type of applications. Uh, they will not go into a mobile banking app always, right? They will come later, maybe when they're a student or when their context change. So up to you also to read that context through data analytics, machine learning, AI, all of that. And again, the, 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 the fundamental issues now on, the, on, on embedded finance is to build bricks that are uh, proof you know, technology proof, uh, resilient, scalable, and um, protect the customer and protect the data of the customer. Thank you for that, Eric. And so we're gonna move to our final question. This one is for Samora, but Eric, if you do have some brief input at the end, I also think it applies to you. To what extent does embedded finance actually grow the financial services market by including the previously excluded versus growing top line revenues by expanding its share of wallet of existing financial services customers? Um, thanks for the question. So, so if I get it right, it's like, um, how does embedded finance grow financial market uh, in general, the size of the financial market in general, and potentially looking at KPAs such as financial inclusion? And I think, I mean, the, the best example of embedded finance in, in Kenya, for instance, is, is say Mshwari. So Mshwari is a savings and lending product um, embedded into M-Pesa, right? Uh, in principle, it's API driven uh, banking service distributed through, as Eric said, a big player and the same as Jumo and, 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 and et cetera. And this now grew to like around 31 million uh, accounts as we speak maybe 24, 25 million, um, um, 24, 25 million, you know, active customers. And you're looking at daily disbursements of potentially $10 million uh, and, and, and you know, significant savings. So I think the, the potential for financial inclusion is huge because in principle, the paradigm is to separate, as we said, the manufacturing and the distribution. Uh, so I think, um, you know, embedded finance and API driven banking uh, can significantly grow the total market in general. And if you look at measures such as KPA and uh, I mean measures such as financial inclusion and uh, other measures such as, you know, the asset, the total assets of the banking sector, there's significant potential there. And also, uh, of course, to grow the top line uh, revenue for banks. Um, of course, the nature of embedded finance is that not everyone will win. Um, if you look at China, for instance, with Ant Group and Alibaba, uh, as, as Eric has said, banks have been taken into the box. It now, you know, they, they, they operate behind a curtain and the customer is interacting with, 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 with an app such as Alibaba or, or Antpay. And what that does is that it really reduces the margin for a bank um, and actually reduces your pricing power. And so a lot of consideration has to be taken into your strategy. And one of them is like, do you actually have the capability to compete at scale with some of these tech players? Um, you know, if, you, if you're a young 25 year old developer, do you want to work for Microsoft or you want to work for a bank? And <laughs> those are some of the questions, you know, that in the background. And, uh, and I think those, those are questions the bank has to answer. And in my view, um, most likely banks will have to now approach more infrastructure plays and balance sheet plays as opposed to competing for the consumer user experience. As, as Eric said, of course, within different contexts. So as just going back to the question, it can really grow the balance sheet, grow the, the asset book and grow financial inclusion if done well.
Awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Samara. Thanks a lot. I think we're, we're going to wrap up with our last and final question, really. Um, uh, you know, is embedded finance the future of fintech in Africa? Um, Eric, if you have any last words to, to wrap up, then we'll pass that around to the panelists and, and get their, their opinions. Look, I, I hope embedded finance has a good feature. I can tell you embedded finance has a good feature in Africa. In Africa, Is that going to translate into always everywhere a good future for, for Africa? I'm, I'm hoping that. I'm betting on the fact that uh, regulations uh, is going to come uh, to help um, realizing how quickly this is taking. They always come a step behind. So it's up to us uh, to look at embedded finance and to implement uh, implement solutions that are meaningful for customers and that are making a difference. I was very fortunate to be at the very start of mobile payments, in, in fact, in Kenya. Uh, so I, I, you know, for, I have in my, in my experience delivered the very first mobile money transfer uh, platform in Kenya to a, an operator called Kencel, and that was in 2000, 2001, maybe. So way before even Safaricom. Um, but uh, where is the future? The, this journey basically has demonstrated to me that you know, things that we were presenting already 20 years ago, 25 years ago, are only really happening at scale now. So it has taken time, no matter how quick we think you know, technology is driving change and it's it is accelerating. True, it is incredibly fast now. But there are certain things that take time. And, uh, and if you look at mobile money, it is reaching now 20 plus years. Um, and it's, it has demonstrated that it has lifted economies. Kenya is, is, the, is the shining example of what happened, of what, how a transformation can occur through mobile phones. Ghana is next, you know, quickly catching up. Um, we're looking all eyes and everybody's looking at how Nigeria is going to digitally transform and accelerate. It is doing an incredible job. Uh, it has the first instant payment technology that facilitates now also account to account transactions. So it's actually a push payment as opposed to a, a pull payment, which is a card type transaction. It's a very efficient mechanism that is also incredibly cost-effective and is proving to make and to transform, to be transformational for uh, a country like Nigeria. Embraced in the right manner by um, the whole ecosystem of Nigeria, uh, it has the potential to lift and to accelerate trade in a massive way, okay? Because trade, especially in a COVID time, has become very complex. It has to be done online somehow. Um, one of the key issues before embedded payment, I think, is solving identification. For me, this is fundamental. It's a, it's a piece that needs to be defined. Um, it could be uh, in a model similar to embedded finance, uh, but it's a, it's a milestone that is required before we can build embedded, the fully fledged embedded finance environment. And then, um, the other brick that we fundamentally need is a low data connections, low cost data connections, not low speed, low cost data connection and high speed. Um, to give you just an example, India is transforming digitally at incredible pace right now. They have the, done the digital piece, the ID piece, national ID piece, and then they have also a cost of gigabyte, a cost of data per gigabyte, which is down to six US cents. Now, I don't know if you know what is the average cost of a gigabyte of data in Africa, but it's the same as in the US, funny, which is highly deregulated. It's on average seven US dollars, six US cents in, in, in India. Some countries, $14 for a gigabyte of data. So connectivity and solving the connectivity divide is super important. You know, feature phones are feature phones. Can we make them smarter? You know, smart feature phones exist also with operating system that helps. Um, fortunately, the, the, the smartphones will become and will be in the hands of majority of, Afri of Sub-Saharan Africans in a, a very near future. For me, that's really where 
embedded finance is going to come uh, and, and is going to leverage that. The economies of scales are going to be there for banks to satisfy their return on assets for, uh, I mean by that, lenders, uh, for insurance companies to be able to do micro insurance and take a micro fee on events. And yes, when I climb in a taxi and that the taxi driver is not himself insured, I would rather pay for that trip a little premium to make sure that if something happened, I am covered. It's an example. But embedded finance has a great future. I hope I, I can uh, solve that. I think responsible development is fundamental. Partnerships and responsible, uh, we need to build those responsible frameworks, whether it's on data, whether it's on how we deal with API, how do we make secure APIs, and whether we deal with um, fraud in general. You know, create those firewalls as an industry and make sure that we, uh, we have top-notch technologies. But I think all the components are there, so I'm very confident. For, awesome. Thank you very much. Gian, what's the future for, for LAMI and uh, embedded finance across, uh, across Africa? Um, I think the most exciting uh, thing about embedded finance is the role that it's going to play to drive financial inclusion um, and financial security. I think it has a huge role to, pl uh, to play because it's going to help reduce all the barriers, for example, for first time customers for insurance, for first time customers of credit and so many other financial services. I think that's going to be one of the biggest um, things that's actually that's going to have a huge impact on, on the level of financial inclusion. And, and for the end customers, I think it's going to offer them uh, the most variety probably that they've ever had in terms of options, in terms of structure, pricing structures, uh, in terms of providers. Um, so they'll have this, you know, they'll be able to choose and, and make the right choices for themselves. And, and for, for businesses, um, I think it's going to help them lower costs substantially. Um, so I think it's going to have a, hopefully a huge effect on, on, on increasing um, uh, financial inclusion over the next few years. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, Philip, do you wanna jump in there? What's, what does the future look like for, for Twiga and how are you guys gonna be using uh, embedded tech? embedded fintech. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the future for Twigo with uh, embedded uh, finance, um, whether on the payment side, uh, on the uh, credit side, as well as, um, you know, eventually we, we, we do plan on getting, uh, ensuring that uh, insurance is loaded in there. Uh, we're, we're all sold in. Uh, Ultimately, what this does is that it typically it it adds more stickiness. It uh, adds more value to our vendors, uh, essentially our core customer base. Uh, it keeps them coming back uh, to our uh, to our app um, over time. You know, as uh, you know that that uh, connectivity divide. You know, as more people get uh, more access to 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 data and to smartphones. Uh, you know, the uh, experience that we, <clears throat> uh, the core experience that the, uh, that, that our vendors or customers uh, will have will shift more from a physical one-on-one -on -one type of engagement to uh, a digital first, or in fact, a digital only uh, uh, experience. And through that, that ensure that that is a huge enabler uh, to uh, in, you know to to the embedded uh, to embedding uh, financial services uh, uh, therein. Um, yes, yeah, so it's uh, so it's looking good uh, and uh, really looking forward to it. Awesome, thanks a lot. <laughs> I actually have a follow up question. We keep we're getting a lot of questions about you know people getting into the system. You know, um, we we're, we're, people are wondering whether or not uh, these products are just expanding. Uh, 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 financial services through current distribution models and how people are getting onto the system uh, and getting included. And I was wondering, Philip, maybe if you can talk about, you know, from, from your perspective, how you guys are onboarding uh, 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 new new people onto to your uh, supplier side. Um, when you say supplier side, are you talking about uh, partners or what do you, uh, what do you refer to? Yeah, I'm like to? partners, maybe it's cooperatives or, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 
yeah i think uh, okay um yes so so that's uh so so on the partnership side um that's that's obviously something that we uh, we are quite deliberate about um and uh always ready to hear uh uh you know any new uh or cool uh you know beneficial uh, opportunities um, that can add value uh, you know to our to our customer base as well as um, to uh, to us as Twiga as a whole um, so always uh, our ears are always open for that um, it's essentially just uh, reaching out uh, uh, to, to myself uh, primarily um, and and from there now uh, before any integration is ever really done <laughs> that's uh, so obviously we'd have to uh, engage well and 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 uh, align well on 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 where we're heading uh, together as as partners. The yes, um, you know, just just to put that um, uh, plainly, yeah. Thank you very much, Samora. Can you talk about what you're seeing across uh, across the industry in terms of the future of embedded finance? Yeah, so thanks. I mean, I'm really hopeful and uh, I'm really excited about where embedded finance can go to. Uh, I mean, it, in this case, saying embedded finance is actually enabling finance to be delivered where it's needed and where it's used. And you know, one of the one of the interesting use cases I see that potentially will emerge down the line is social. So embedding finance into apps like WhatsApp, uh, TikTok, and other social apps. And, and then enabling a whole new sense of uh, a creative economy to emerge from this. Um, so you can imagine if uh, savings groups had a WhatsApp group where payments and savings were embedded into it so that you can actually on a monthly basis, you know, make your payments and stuff like that. And I think as we talk about embedded finance and, you know, from my research from the blog, one thing that keeps emerging is that you know, as much as finance is an interesting uh, space, the underlying production structures and underlying means of uh, enabling Africans to earn income, I think that's what we need to solve for the most. And I think when you when you approach embedded finance as a way of enabling Africans to earn from content creators to farmers who can now market their produce on WhatsApp and receive payments, I think that's what's the most interesting for me. And so I think that's where embedded finance should be uh, headed to, and it actually creates a huge opportunity for everyone. Awesome, thanks very much. And uh, Hilda, please, can you, can you wrap up for us? Well, thanks, I think, uh, you know, we, we as Pazesha, we believe that uh, embedded finance is uh, the future, um, you know, now more than ever because of COVID, I think prosperity should be our focus. And embedded finance is helping us achieve prosperity. You know, how we, can we embed credit in a productive way to achieve a shared prosperity? So we are excited about that vision in really achieving, um, you know, that prosperity. But more importantly, I think, um, you know, every company is gonna be a FinTech, whether they like it or not, whether you're not doing FinTech right now, um, you're gonna at some point have to do financial services to grow your revenue. And so we have built a lending infrastructure to allow anyone, any company to plug and play financial services through our APIs that are vast and scalable. So the future is already here, we cannot deny, and we are gonna do that. COVID has accelerated that, that, uh, that ambition. And, and the prosperity should be at the center of our focus when you think about embedded finance. And that is really what it drives, productivity, efficiency, and prosperity at the end of it all. Then we're gonna talk about meaningful financial inclusion because that's really where we are right now. That's the future, thank you. Thank you all for your responses. Before we move to closing remarks, we'd like to pose a question to you all, the audience, via polls after today's discussion. Do you believe that embedded finance is the future of Africa? So I've launched the poll and we'd love to see your responses. And as you all respond to that, I want to thank 
A big thank you to our panelists for a riveting and thoughtful discussion. I know I can say I learned a lot from you all. Um, thank you to our attendees who are currently voting, but also for being so engaged and attending our webinar. Um, yeah, so right now already we're seeing 86% are saying yes for 13% are saying no. Um, I'm gonna let it go on a little bit longer, but for those who have to go, we hope you have a great day or evening, depending on where you're zooming in from. If you'd like to learn more about Possession or any of our panelists, we will send a follow-up email with their socials and contact information. Once again, thank you and goodbye. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye everyone, bye. Bye-bye everyone, thank you. Uh Thank <laughs> you.